Hi, everyone. My name is Oliver Schultz. I'm Curatorial Director at Pace Gallery in New York. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here today for a conversation between artist Arlene Sheckett and designer Gary Fogelson on the occasion of Skirts, a new book on Arlene's work that Pace is thrilled to have just published. Many thanks to our friends at Printed Matter for finding a way to make this really, really important event go forward virtually and in a far less sweaty and cramped manner than we're all used to, um, which is you know, one silver lining, I suppose. Um, Skirts serves as an extension of Arlene's first exhibition at Pace in New York, which om opened almost exactly one year ago and closed only a few weeks later with the outbreak of the pandemic, which was a you know, story we've heard again and again um, from artists who experienced that. Uh, the book includes two fantastic new interviews with Arlene in which she's in conversation with uh, Deborah Solomon and Michaela Mormon, um, as well as a really great new critical essay by the scholar uh, Rachel Silveri. Before we begin uh, today, I just want to give a quick shout out to our friends at Delmonico Books, um, at whose booth I believe you will find The Sleeve Should Be Illegal and Other Reflections on Art at the Frick. Um, which is an intriguing sounding new title, uh, which includes an essay by Arlene, um, one among many reasons you should check it out. Please also do uh, be aware that our friends at Hunters Point Press will tomorrow, Friday at 3 p.m., be hosting uh, a talk with Arlene and the artist B. Wirtz, who will be in conversation with Daniel S. Palmer. So check that out. Um, Arlene, you're obviously very busy. Uh, and we're grateful for your presence here today. Um, not least busy collaborating with Gary Fogelson on this wonderful book, so which we're for, so fortunate to have um, in our hands finally at last. And I'll just take a moment to introduce Arlene and Gary. Meanwhile, let me just let you look at the book. Arlene Sheckett is an artist based in New York in the Hudson River Valley. Equal parts sculptor, conceptualist, and alchemist, Shaggett has compared her studio practice to both a factory and a farm. An ardent experimentalist, Arlene is uh, widely celebrated for her boundary-defying engagement with ceramics, um, often integrating kiln-fired objects with materials like wood, metal, plaster, and concrete to produce works that challenge our most basic assumptions about sculptural experience. Her work ceaselessly demands, I think, that we really redefine what we mean when we talk about color and form in relation to embodiment and physicality and nature, and also to the poetics of gravity and time and transformation. Um, her works have been exhibited and collected by major museums and institutions in the US and internationally. And we're looking forward to her upcoming show of new work at Pace in Palo Alto next month. Uh, in which she'll be showing uh, a body of work that I think is quite relevant in some ways to our discussion today, because it it's very much comes out of Arlene's interest and in thinking about the medieval form of the Book of Hours. So it's about the relationship in some sense between sculpture and books, the experience of a book. We're also very fortunate to have with us today Gary Fogelson, uh, who worked closely with Arlene to design this book. Uh, Gary is a graphic designer, and co-founder and partner at Other Means, a studio here in New York City, which specializes in, in what I would call sort of bespoke collaborations with clients across the arts, architecture, fashion, media, and so on. Gary has worked on projects with numerous major institutions, many of them pillars of our own arts community here in New York, including the Shed, the Goethe Institute, the Guggenheim, ICA Philadelphia, and recently MoMA PS1, where he designed the catalog for the major 2019 exhibition, Theater of Operations, which is how he and I originally met. And I think actually that book and the cover of that book played some role in your early conversations with Arlene, Gary, and we, maybe we can return to that when we talk about the cover. Um, but I guess I would start by just first kind of directing to Arlene the question of what what happened a year ago? I mean, you going back in time when Skirts opened, you were already in conversation with Gary about making this book um, and then the exhibition closed. And I guess how, in what way would you maybe now looking back, think about how that experience of living in the kind of lockdown um, and in the ensuing months of isolation 
How did that change or affect or otherwise have an influence on the way you approached making this book with Gary? I mean, once, of course, you knew that it was happening. So that would be where I would start kind of back in time and maybe move forward to the present from there. Yeah. Oh, well, I think it's a good question because hopefully we're not going to be, I'm not going to be having that experience again. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, um, certain, so s I think we can say it's a unique experience and um, I, when it happened, uh, I was just, you know, when there was, sh when the show had to close down and so many things just got immediately shut. I mean, there were tons of things that were just about to happen in relationship to having the show in terms of people seeing it. Uh, and, uh, you know, all kinds of tours coming through, all kinds of curators, you know, all this promise of stuff. And then not just the non-promise, but the possibility of death uh you know was suddenly happening and scurrying around there was afterwards when I finally got to sit down I realized I was having this experience that I would say was like being separated at birth uh um from from my uh from my work forget you know just the show I had been working on for a couple of years uh, and I was Gary had so fortunately come to the studio while I was before the work was done um, and so those early moves really flooded back to me that oh my god thank god Somebody saw it, thank God, you know, will this book happen? And I am being very uncomfortably weaned from my work uh, ahead of time. You know, I, this is not supposed to be how it is because every artist out there um, uh, knows that having the show is the completion of the work, not completing the work in the studio is not is one thing but sharing it having people participate in it is the completion of the work not only that it's my experience the artist's experience of seeing and feeling people interact with the work that is so important so and my experience of actually getting to look at it in a in a foreign environment or which it also happened to be an environment that I designed specifically for the work you know where the walls are where the pieces are in relationship to one another so all of those things just were um, really um, foremost in my brain and then there was the thing there was just a feeling of immense gratitude that we had gotten this project underway and that there would be, with all of the pain of being separated, there would be, um, and I think you're, the word you used was really good, an extension of the show taking the form of the book. And that, that's what I wanted and that's what, I think Gary also wanted and what we worked, all of us, you know, the Pace team, everybody involved, Deborah, Mika, you know, Rachel, to make that this book is not a document of, it's much more than that. It's, uh, it, it's a, an extension of the show. So, the experience of that, um, of getting, making it happen um, so that there was some, some, there is some resolution to that very disrupted experience uh, 
And just yesterday, having received the book, you know, I, I lit literally have this bodily feeling of release, like, okay, it's a it did happen. Yeah, because as everybody knows, the, the world became mushy uh, and still is, but was mushier then. And so this, this did it happen, where, I, where am I, who am I, why am I, you know, uh, taking residency, you know, and being comfort. I, I basically am comforted by this book. Uh, so I, I would say, and the book is a very solid thing. The book is so good. And then it's also like, it's so, it's so much better than Can you show I it imagined. to us again, Arlene? Yeah. Because I haven't seen it in the flesh. There it is. It, it's nice it's, to see it in your hands. Yeah. I mean, every, every part of it is something that we had discussion about. And that was a very unique experience. So it was really doing the book is extremely akin to doing, making the work, which is usually I'm working on something for a year or two. So it actually had this arc of time that is very familiar to me. And I would say that this is you know, really another w work as part of that show. I think that's, uh, so that's, it's great. that's so useful, Arlene. Thank you so much for that because it, it also raises the question of, you know, that it's universal in some ways to all books that are also in some ways catalogs or tasked with that, that they have to stand in for a show that maybe you'll never see. I mean, some of my favorite yeah. shows are shows I never saw because they happened before I was born, but I have a book that is the show for me on so many levels. Um, it is how I imagine it and project myself back in time into it. And this show only lasted two weeks, even though it could have lasted a lot longer. But you know, even if it had lasted all summer, still many would never have seen it. So how does a book stand in for an ex exhibition? But how does it stand in even more urgently at a time when you know that the show has been truncated in a way um, and not been allowed to go on? And I guess I would ask you, Gary, like did that, how did you translate or think about translating the materiality, the physicality, the kind of spatial dynamics of what it means to encounter Arlene's work and what it did in that exhibition. How did you approach a book? Um, how did you approach that in a book? Because it's such a radically different thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I was talking with um, Noah Beckwith, who's a designer that, that works in our studio. And we worked very closely together on, on the design in the studio. And we were talking about this the other day. And Arlene's show is like the last thing we did before the lockdown, you know, it was like the, the last kind of cultural experience before, you know, it was in early March. And um, so it's kind of strange to have that be, um, you know, this thing that kind of lingered on for the, over the past year while we were working on it. Um, but, but as you said, Arlene, like we did, you know, I did have the chance to come up and see the work in the studio and um, my, whole impression of the work and what the book needed to do was completely informed by that experience and not really seeing it in the gallery initially. Um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that the, that the works were still in process. And I think also, frankly, like part of me was like, wait, the show's in a couple months and these works are still being developed. Like that felt like a really nice thing to be a part of. Cause it was like, okay, like I'm like, we're part of this together. Like we're all making this thing together. So that was really nice. Um, and also like just your studio in Kingston um seeing all the materials that you were surrounded with the things that were making their way into the works the things that had been discarded and then discussing the, those materials and what drew you to them really did inform a lot of the early thinking about the book and mainly that we knew that we wanted to play with materials in the in in the object of the book and i think that just by doing that or acknowledging that we wanted to play with materials it made the we knew that the book was going to be more than just like a catalog or a neutral thing. Like it was going to be an object. And um, you said a couple things. I was just looking at my notes from, um, from, from that studio visit. And you, you said a couple of things that I jotted down that are like that, that informed some of those things. And one was um, the idea of like geometric and organic form being the same thing. 
The other one was we were having this long conversation about what it was like to live in this modernist house in the woods, which is like, you know, where you live in, in Woodstock. And um, <clears throat> something else about like paper and like wood being <laughs> like the same thing, you know, like, and, and how, you know, all of those things kind of informed a lot of the decisions that went into the book. And um, one is the shape, which is like this, um, um, it's like the golden ratio, which is the shape that designers use all the time that I've somehow managed my entire career never touching, which I'm proud to say. Um, but we thought it'd be nice to make this like really tall, skinny book, um, which also reflects like the proportion of some of the work. Um, the golden ratio being this, this, this logic that lives in both nature and in kind of, you know, uh, the built environment and architecture in particular. Um, and then also playing with paper and wanting, wanting the reader of the book to, um, to really understand that they're holding something that was made, that the paper is something that um, they notice as they flip through the book. And also that we're using um, different kinds of paper that, um, you know, allude or suggest to the fact that you can do these wildly different things with this simple material. I mean, and it's not, these, it's not like a huge idea, but it's a sort of subtle gesture that you move through the book and you see uh, standard kind of uncoated paper and then you, you encounter glossy paper and then you're encountering a kind of craft and a metallic and, you know, and so on. So, and, and they, they work in different ways, you know, which maybe we can talk about later, but that was like initially um, something that came out of those discussions, which is, which is really all about materials but not trying to quote Arlene's work, you know, not trying to like make a book that looked like a sculpture that, that was in the show, but rather like a book that maybe was investigating similar themes. Um, it feels know, but, like but, it comes but, out of a kind of material sensibility that is deeply yeah. resonant of Arlene's work without yeah, being and also like, like, you know, we, as Arlene mentioned, we had lots of discussions about every aspect and something that I I love is that when you're printing a book, like you often can't find things because it's not available. And so we'd have a lot of the discussions we had about materials were like, oh, we love this thing, but we can't get it. Or, you know, this isn't gonna work. So what's an, what's another option? And that you're, you're forced to reckon with the very real limitations of just producing something. Um, you know, with all the, all those constraints and how that informs the 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 book making process, and that's like all the conversation that happens before we even talk about kind of the most important thing, which is like, what does the work look like in the book? How is the rest of it laid out? But it's really just really starting to think about it from that perspective of what's the object, what does it feel like, and how does it relate to kind of the sensibility of the work in the show. I mean, to those points, I'm so interested in your decision to print on both coded and uncoded paper and different colored paper and how did the logic of the images and the plates sort of unfold how does it unfold in the book and I can kind of switch here to a, another yeah group. so um we had this so you know when, when books are when books are um bound they're um you know this book has um a sequence of signatures that are sewn. And so that, that creates a kind of rhythm naturally to like how you sequence these sections. Um, and this book's actually mostly done in 12 page sections. And we originally proposed um, an idea that we embrace that kind of flow through the book that the plates would kind of be the primary sections but that each section of plates and each of, of works would be wrapped with a paper, with another paper. So we would wrap it with a glossy sheet that would um, be used to represent the images of the installation at pace. Uncoated paper is used for the details of the works, most of which were shot actually at Arlene's studio. Um, and that we then introduce a kind of unique, one of three unique paper stocks that um, appear through the book in three sections um, and that we decided to use to um, um, distribute the, the three texts in the book throughout. So actually, as you're flipping through the book, you can't really read um, any of the text in one solid chunk. It, everything is separated by 
the work. And so as you, you move through, you sort of start, you get two pages of text, then you see the first sculpture and installation, and then you get the next couple of pages of text. And that rhythm takes you out, takes you throughout the whole book, um, which I think that when we proposed the kind of structural idea, we, we didn't really know what we would do with those, <laughs> those different papers. We just knew that we wanted them to be in the book. And then through conversations, Arlene was made the suggestion that it would be exciting to break the text up, which was like great for us to hear because that's the kind of thing that we might suggest and have someone tell us that it's a terrible idea and that they, they don't want to do that. So we we're really happy that she, um, you know, was was interested in having such a kind of aggressively fragmented way of dealing with the text, which, you know, I think, you know, from our perspective, it's like, it forces the reader to engage with the whole book. like. That you, you can't just come in and read a text. You have to you have to use the whole thing and you have to be you have to encounter the the sculptures as you move through. Um, so it's it's all kind of intertwined. Arlene, I can't help but just hearing Gary describe this sort of mode of reading that it reminds me a lot of what your sculptures do to us as viewers, what they ask from us or even demand in terms of our engagement with them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when, when, I mean, I hadn't thought about it at all, but when this issue of the papers came up, um, I just found myself saying, like, why don't we just break it up? And I think that it came from that sense of the book shouldn't, again, should be its own experience. Uh, and not just be a document uh, or standalone essays. They, 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 the whole thing, it's a whole. And that I think what you're referring to is my desire to have people walk around all of my artworks and see how a simple form is actually not maybe a simple form and see how the Thing keeps speaking to you when you think you understand it and you know it engages with more than one view but I also think I suggested it naturally as a big reader of art books uh, and viewer where I find myself uh, want you know like when I get a book and it's that that I'm excited to look at, I just want to devour it. And I want to be looking and reading and looking and reading. And it's not necessarily a um, coherent experience. So why should we pretend that we're gonna, that, you know, that, that we have this, somebody sitting in an armchair reading from beginning to end and not looking, you know, and, and looking at only the pictures that relate to the essay and et cetera, et cetera. It just feel, felt like, no, that's, that's just like an old idea that we can break with. Uh, and also, I guess the, over and over again, I have the desire for the thing to be its own object. Cause I feel like this is also a sculpture. Uh, you know that 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 it that the weight of the book, you know this, the proportions, the weight of it, it's like a, a great a great object, and so to investigate it like that is um, super interesting to me. And then, but I also see words as sculptural. Uh, which is one of the reasons, yeah, like how people build words is I could, you know, it's not just concrete poetry, but, you know, the way this is embodied in just, I could open any page that Gary and his team worked on, you know, and you can see they're taking that on, they're taking that conversation on. Uh, so, and some of my favorite uh, pages are where the, the, the sculptures face off with the words and you really, really 
like move back and forth and look at at them um Arlene, these as are such images you oh yeah yeah like that the way it's broken up there that 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 one where that sculpture is called fancy and then there's that intersection of the form and the the form in my sculpture and the form in the in the text uh but also yeah and there's the modernist house there, it, it's uh and there is that craft paper that on the left facing off with the shiny paper on on the right and the craft paper uh does describe how paper is wood uh and uh and and you can see it as wood in that image the way the i was very um interested to see how the images would play on i know how they're going to play on uncoated and coated paper but i didn't know how the images were going to play on the craft paper and i really love it i really, really love the you, absorbency of it i'm really glad that you picked this spread out because you know i just got the book like 20 minutes ago yeah <laughs> I, hadn't, I hadn't seen it yet and uh and you know the thing that's really fun about like i think the, the thing that that was nice about the way we approached this was that um, um, is that there's a some there's some sort of a randomness to this, like to how yeah. this worked out, and um, you know we we're not interested. You know, I'm not generally interested in like creating a kind of hierarchy between text and image. Not not just like typography and image, mm -hmm. but also as like the text in the book and the works in the book, and you know the idea that you might like as you're walking around these sculptures you might also be talking about them like seems like a really natural way of of putting these things together and but there was a lot of practical decisions that had to go into this like the number of works the length of the text like all of these constraints of structuring the paper and that spread where you, the, your ho your house the photo of your house on the left on the craft and then magic matters on the right and the wood and that feels really like too perfectly like we didn't plan I didn't that's not really planned but it, <laughs> but when I saw it I was like oh that really worked out like that's really yeah. good. and I and there is like and also because when we're working on this like there's a sort of ma mental math that you have to do to understand where each page is falling and you don't totally know what it's going to be until it shows up and yeah I was really happy with that that coincidence um because the works were pretty much sequ we tried to sequence the works more or less how you might like meander through through the show and and um and you know i don't re really remember why this work yeah. ended up there but it just it did end up it, it's nice to be in conversation with the with the paper next to it and also this this conversation was 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 a kind of late addition to the book because it was um in part reflecting on on the experience of the show and, and an extension mm. of that and so for a while while we were designing the book there was only two texts and then three was like even better because now we have a reason for a third um, type of paper. So it was like, you know, there's a lot of kind of somewhat random things that ended up working to our favor, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, seemed to be a big part of this and responding to the, that uncertainty and allowing it to kind of operate as you do, Arlene. <laughs> yeah. You work all the time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I there was an, I, I wanted to bring up another, um, thing about the different papers, uh, which is that as you move your hands through the book, your fingers are alive. So, so the, um, that's really special to me, you know, a big part of what I always try to do in the way I work and have worked for the last 30 years is to work with a, an idea about awareness um, and being present. And there is something about touching these pages that each where your fingers don't get um, inured to the feel of the paper 
that brings a, that same kind of awareness into the book. So that was what I was not prepared. Like we're just dealing with designing this book and talking about this book and talking about these texts and talking about these images. But finally yesterday to open it and realize what the experience is in moving through it with one's hand uh, in addition to um, two eyes. Well, that's just, you know, there's no way to describe that. So the thinness, the thickness, you know, the, the whole thing. So going back to what Gary said about being in my studio and seeing all the materials and wanting us to work with materials, I, I hadn't really taken the leap to what it would feel like. I had only thought about what it would look like. Um, and this, I'm gonna just show something. I don't know if you can see, but this spread where it's a single work, a, a single image of, uh, of iron twins and it spans two different papers and you just see this very, very subtle gradation in color. And this piece is made of iron and I have never ever thought that we could <laughs> actually get iron in the book but it really does and you can see it has this metallic on one side and this like uh, other pink quality and of course in three dimensions that's why I'm a sculptor three dimensions just blows away what happens with surfaces because it's light and time and space and you know relation it's very relational so that kind of thing that kind of uh, situation really ex expands upon it. But anyway, the awareness, getting awareness into the book uh, in this kind of subversive, but very um, central way, I, I totally appreciate. Just pulling up here an image of the work that you were just mm -hmm. showing. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's, it's a zo zooming in. And, and what I want is, you know, when you see a book and you're looking at the sexy pictures, cause taking a sexy picture of an artwork, I mean, you know, we, at, the, at a certain point, people know how to do that. Uh, but taking a picture that actually taking, having pictures that actually simulate the experience of what it's like to view something, which is that you're seeing it from afar and then you're going into it. So that's why these details where you're not, it's not a simple detail. It's, it's just like, oh yeah, that's a different experience. It doesn't further explain the work. It explains it in a completely different vocabulary. I it's guess that's like, further you know, When I look back at the photos of that, that I took when I was at your studio. And mm -hmm. I think even I'm sure if you looked at the, any photo that anybody took that was able to actually see the show, like most people are probably like crouching down, leaning around, take, finding like these little moments that, that draw them in and that's what they're photographing. And, um, you know, and I think that in the, in the arrangement of the images of each work, that's what we were aiming to do. We had great, great photographs to work with that you, you created with the, the with the photographers at Pace, and they were doing that like from from your eye already. And so we were trying to arrange them in a way that took you in and out of the sculpture. So you'd see it in its entirety, then you'd see details, you'd see details next to each other sometimes that you would never see at the same time because maybe they're on different sides of the sculpture, but in the book they speak to each other. And then you kind of zoom out and see its context and how you arranged it in the gallery. Um, you know, all kind of using the the proportions and the grid of the book to create that tension and that pacing and embracing the, the moments where the paper is blank so that you just see it as a material, but also that it creates a break between things. Um, and then, as you mentioned at the beginning of the book, we sort of introduced the cast of characters. Like you see a detail of each, <laughs> of, of almost each work. I don't think they're not all there because of the number of pages that we had, but you know, there's details of, 
of, of some of the works at the beginning, each one appearing on all the, the types of paper that you would see later. So it all kind of like everyone's introduced and then they like separate and <laughs> then do their, do their thing later on. Um, and, and, and that was also kind of a risk because, um, you know, like we, we weren't able to test what the four color reproductions look like on, on each of these different paper stocks. Um, and we worked with a really um, um, great uh, lithographer named Sebastian Hanekrut, who's in the Netherlands, who helped us with color correction and oversaw the book production, which was also a enormous, like we had him on board beforehand, but he was able to go on press with us and ensure that wow. everything, or not for us, because we couldn't go. Um, so he was able to oversee that, but it was a, like I didn't know until I got the, um, gathered pages about a you know a couple of weeks ago like how that even played out and and this this dynamic that you were describing with iron twins being on on the left which is like a, a kind of very thin um almost like newsprint type of sheet and then on the right it's on the silver metallic which really picks up that iron quality and having those things next to each other um it's subtle i think we in some ways like, we probably would have wanted it to be less subtle but it's really nice how it plays out like we just had no idea so we didn't, you know, and it's, it's, it's not, yeah, it's not bad. I don't know. I haven't found any mistakes yet. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, we, we but love I just it. Had it for, I've only had it for a couple of minutes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't found any either and I'm not looking for them. Uh, like, that's the thing is like art could, you know, I, it's one of the things about your work, Arlene, is that you take risks, you know, with your glazes, with procedures and you experiment and things presumably don't always work out the way you think they will. And I think this book also, you clearly, you know, took risks with it and weren't sure exactly how it would turn out. And somehow the kiln and the press felt like two machines of uncertainty and possibility that were brought into alignment with this book in an interesting way. Uh, yeah. Well, it's the designer. I think it's that we, other means, Gary, the, you know, that was a, that, that was a guess, but it was a good guess uh that, controlled, that controlled uncertainty let's controlled say. uncertainty yeah yeah because i i in the end i'm not designing it i'm just way i you know i'm just making suggestions and then i think there was maybe at first you had presented a craft uh, like like that it would be a brown craft because right. i'm so earthy about that, actually. Yeah. i'm so earthy that we needed a brown craft. I'm like, no, we're not gonna. Have it wasn't that. brown craft. It was like a. We wanted. There's like we wanted like a kind of almost like a terracotta, which yeah. even more earthy than craft. Yeah. And yeah. You, you said no. No. You wanted it to be shinier. I wanted. You, know, you bling. gave us a couple. You gave us. Yeah. You yeah. wanted bling. You you gave us a really nice constraint, which maybe I can show. One the one okay. thing you said was that you wanted the spine was really important to you, which I think is mm -hmm. really nice to hear because as everyone that has a book knows. I have, I do own books, by the way. Uh, Oliver and Arlene <laughs> have beautiful books behind them, but um, uh, most of the time that you see it, you see the spine. So the spine was really important to you. And so we were, we thought that, okay, well, not only is the proportion of the book important, but someone that has this book will likely also have the catalog that was made for your show at ICA Boston. And those two books would live next to each other. And so um, we weren't thinking about how the typography necessarily related, but we wanted the books to be the same height so that they sat next to each other. So the, like, you know, base, and actually, um, so that, you know, those two books can so look good. like the same height, which you just pointed out earlier. Now all your other books are the wrong height. <laughs> um, but at least these two work well together. Yeah, um, yeah. But Just the other down. thing, uh, um, so that was a really like we never would have, you know, we never would have thought about something like that. But it was really nice for us to think about. And actually, when the book dummy arrived, you pointed out that they weren't, they didn't match. And yeah. we actually had to go back in and adjust the entire book by like an eighth of an inch so that it would match when it showed up. <laughs> Um, and we did cut it down, <laughs> which was great. And then the other really funny request that came from the gallery, not Arlene, this wasn't one of your requests, but 
there was a request that the book be quiet and not like visually quiet, but literally quiet that when you flip through the pages, it doesn't make noise, which is also <laughs> something I never <laughs> would think about when designing a book. And it is, it worked, it's quiet. We, I can't say that we did anything. I just sort of thought, well, I mean, most books, I don't know if you do something wrong, maybe they're loud, but anyway, so there's some really like interesting requests that were coming in that drove some choices um, in, and drove us in a direction that we wouldn't go, um, which was great. I wanna, I wanna great, ask you, know. you, Gary, about the cover um, and both of you, but it's so striking and the choice to make it text only and to have this really interesting typography um, it's notable. Yeah, so, I mean, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, something that I, I hope is clear <laughs> through this conversation is that ultimately I think my studio and Arlene have a sh some shared sensibilities, which have led to a good collaboration. But when we started out, that wasn't immediately clear because we had never worked on anything together. You know, like, it, it, I don't think it was immediately clear, like what how that would how that would necessarily play out, and we were relieved that. And I think our first conversation, unanimously, Arlene and 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 folks from Pace were like, "No image. We're not doing an image, right?" Uh, and it was like, "Okay, great," because we don't. I mean, I, you know, we don't. Um, I think that that freed us up to make something that was a lot more. Um, responsive to the ideas in the work than trying to make it about a specific work. I don't know, it's just, we just knew that that was not gonna be particularly interesting. And so the typography on the cover is kind of an illustration, like a kind of graphic version of a lot of the other typographic moves that happen in the book in a much more subtle way, um, subtle in comparison to the cover, um, which is that it's dealing with arrangement balance and tension and reflection and all of the things that you kind of go through as you move around the work and um fragmentation um, so actually, yeah and and so um so so actually inside the book the way that the typography is arranged there's moments for example in the text where if there's no footnotes it almost feels like the the balance is off but at there's moments where everything comes in where everything kind of falls into place um but it's meant to kind of have this, this slightly imbalanced asymmetrical quality. And then of course, in the conversation, it mimics the back and forth of conversation, but on the cover and the, and the front and back cover, it's really about this kind of, this moving around um, uh, and rearranging. And, and maybe it's also in some ways about, um, you know, it, it ultimately the, the letters and words found their place, but there's, I think it suggests like several other arrangements that are possible, like that that this cover is just one arrangement that these letters could take and they just happen to start to spell out Arlene's name and the title of the show, but there's like all these other permutations that are that are that are possible, which which I think is also something at least that I you know I find uh, in the work. Um, and the choice to justify Gary the I in skirts with the K and the R, but then the T, you know, it's like it reminds me that that words are marks and little lines. And to your point, Arlene, that like language and, and yes, you know, drawing, they're not so different. They're mark making. Well, I, I in fact would argue that this is an image. So I think, I think we, there is an image on the cover <laughs> and the back, you know, there is an image that wraps around and into this book, but definitely on the cover. I, it's, if it had not been using the words, you know, the letters this way, maybe it wouldn't have been, uh, but you made it an image. And I think that's quite, quite wonderful. I, I think when you came to my studio, I had, I had given a talk at Yale um, a couple of years ago and they have a really nice graphic, a great graphic design department. Not that I was in touch with anybody specifically, but every time artists came, they 
come they have the department make a poster and I have this great poster in my Kingston studio where they worked with the letters and I was like that that is unbelievable and I haven't been able to find who made it like I've actually tried to track that person down but it was I think that also helped us have the conversation you know it helped us uh helped us know one another like now I think how could I have ever made a book with somebody who hadn't come to my who who doesn't come to the studio you know I I don't I don't I don't see that ever happening again um and similarly what was great was everybody like Rachel Silveri who has a beautiful essay um in the book, you know, got into that show and we had long talks. Um, she was there for two days and we had talks before, you know, and w- not know- thinking that we were speaking and that we didn't know what was gonna happen the next week, uh, you know, is quite sobering. But, and uh, Deborah Solomon uh, and uh, had been at the, opening and had gone back you know all of those all of those things that happened surrounding you know to surrounding the actual making of the book uh the the literal nitty-gritty stuff you know are so just so important um and I'm so grateful for I mean I'm interested to hear the reactions from the writers um about the the essay, you know, being um, the essays and the the interviews being cut up. I mean, an interview by its very nature is cut up. Uh, the essay less so. Um, but I, um, I, you know, I hope that I hope that they think it's okay. We can send the PDF. We can send the PDF in one piece too. You know. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think it's a really yeah. wonderful experience for the reader because you're forced to to look as well as read at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Thing and yeah. that that is part of what your work demands. You know, it really is um, that movement between oddly, you know, the abstract nature of what you do somehow lends itself toward language. I find in a really interesting counterintuitive mm. way. Um, yeah. And somehow that happens in this book very organically. But yeah. I think we're, we're sort of coming toward the end here. So if anyone has questions, please feel free to raise your hand um, and we will happily call on you. Um, you can also chat things, I think. But um, we do have one question from the chat here from Henry Hauser. Arlene, with so many different materials being used in your work, please describe how you make your sculpture in your studio. What's in your studio? I guess we should first say Arlene has two studios. Um, one in Woodstock and another in Kingston. But maybe since this book shows your Woodstock studio to some extent, or the scene of the studio, maybe one way to drill down on that would be like, what do you do in Woodstock that's particular to Woodstock? And how that, you know, since you were there and working there without assistance in the pandemic, maybe you could talk a little bit about that being in that place and thinking about that space, which was not where you made the work in skirts, right? For the most part. Um, I use both studios. Uh, I pretty much go back and forth. They're about 15 minutes apart. Uh, You know, if not every day, then almost every day. Uh, And the different, the, well, they're, they're really very, very different, but the, the Woodstock studio has the kiln. So anything that's made of clay usually begins and ends there. Uh, and then the parts are brought to Kingston where I have a wood shop. Uh, so there's maybe, and also the scale are different, like the Woodstock studio is uh, on a dirt road you know, up a steep incline and not the easiest place to get in and out of. Uh, But the, and the Kingston studio is in a 
like funky industrial neighborhood and is an old factory. Uh, so, and, and larger than the, um, than, than the Woodstock studio. So I can drive in and out. So I, yeah. And I have access to, um, steel workers and there's a foundry nearby and, you know, I've been at not, at, you know, and I've only had the, the Kingston studio for three years. So I found ways to do all this stuff before the Kingston studio, but it's made, uh, made it when I think when I was doing Madison Square Park and this, I ne needed to get large, very large things in and out with a semi, <laughs> that was not gonna happen in, in, in Woodstock. And it was, a, it, it was probably an inevitable thing that would happen anyway, but it just pushed it ahead. So, um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I guess the question to me would be, I can't imagine working in one material. Uh, so, I mean, cause I don't just work in those materials. I also do a lot of painting and I see the, I see that the glaze, you know, the glazes are me enacting a kind of painter self. And, and so, uh, I, Can I, just I think jump in, Arlene, I'm just and built like, I'm just built like that. I want, I want to, you are indeed. I want to also observe though, that like your, your Woodstock studio is also where you live and you have a garden mm -hmm. there and the relationship to nature is very particular. And I, yeah. you chose to, you sent me this image of this spread of the book where you have on the left, um, one of your works from the show where you have various materials sort of pushed up Sandwich. against one another in this very intimate encounter. And then on, on the right is the gap between your house and your studio, which you kind of walk over over these series of bridges, which is really wonderful. And it's one of that most remarkable little kind of spaces that speaks, I think, very directly to your work and also to this book, because empty spaces and gaps and connecting places are so important to this design and to how this book functions. So I also, yeah. maybe it's interesting to think about your studio, not just as the space in which you make, you know, all sorts of objects and things and paintings, but also that whole zone in which you operate aesthetically, which includes like the garden and the woods, at least it seems to, to from my perspective, include those things too. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Uh, anyway, I don't, I'm sure that doesn't answer the question, but you know, I don't want to go on and on. Uh, well, the, the question was, was broad, so. <laughs> yeah. You do a lot of things in your studio. Yeah, yeah. I just, it's that's. I've always worked in a lot of materials, so it's not. It's 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 not something that like when I was in school, they were just so critical of me, because I just would not stay in one place. Uh, you know, I was like hungry to just learn all of. I was like, wait, I'm in the playpen here, and I'm gonna try all the tools toys so I know how to what to do when I get out uh, uh, I'm not here to make a product it turns out schools want you to make a product uh, everyone wants you to make a product I know I know it's not the we time you just did make a product you made we just did. I did <laughs> now making products I get I get that uh, but at school no I'm very against that I guess the trick is to not let ourselves be made into products. That is a trick. That is a trick. <laughs> but you know, I do think this book transcends its status as a product because it, there is a kind of, and it, maybe the fragmentation of, of it and the counterintuitiveness and the kind of play with materials all lend itself on the one hand to being desirable and to being precious. And I want one, you know, I'm, I'm sure many of us will want one, but at the same time, um, some of that desire is also frustrated by the way the book is put together. And there's a little bit of a labor on the part of, of the reader or the viewer that I think is, you know, there's a heft to that and you have to exert yourself a little bit as one does when you crawl, crawl you know, get on your hands and knees to take a picture of one of your sculptures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I feel like, okay, if you want to read the whole essay, you have, you're gonna have to look at all of some pictures. 
you can't just you're gonna just be forced to do that uh and if you want to look at the pictures you're gonna have to probably come across some words that might you know catch you uh so the that seems like a a good thing i think that may be also a good place to end well thank you both so much this was really very fun thing. very fun and so exciting to have this book i hope everyone uh checks it out gets a copy immediately um run to pacegallery.com or to printed matter thank you to printed matter thank you to everyone who helped make this talk happen thank you so much gary thank you so much arlene lovely talking to both of you thank you, thank you. oliver thank you. thanks everyone all right bye have a good day right.